Okay, so thank you for staying until my talk. And this is my talk, uh, my joint work with a previous undergraduate student visiting in the summer, Yu Ting, and who is currently attending a PhD program at UC Berkeley. And in this in this talk, I want to talk about our recent work about applying the the technique which is commonly used in a lot of like artificial intelligence, machine learning, and also genomics. That's called negative, factor, negative matrix factorization. And we'll apply this method to do pre-selection on possible mRNA isoform candidates so that we can increase the accuracy of identifying isoforms from RNA sequencing data. So let me first introduce the background. So here the background is the central dogma, which is the fundamental principle that applies to almost every genomic problem. And central dogma describes how information flows from DNA to mRNA to protein. And for RNA sequencing data, our specific interest is about transcription. So we're interested which genes are transcribed into mRNAs, and which types of mRNA, which we call isoforms, if they are different sequences from the same gene, we call them different mRNA isoforms. And we are interested in which isoforms are expressed from the same gene. So alternative splicing is the step during the transcription that governs that phenomenon. So suppose that this is one gene with four axons, then these different axons are pieces pieced together into different isoforms. And the parts between two axons, which we call introns, are often spliced out. So theoretically, if we just consider these axons, how many possible isoforms can we get from the axons? That will be 2 to the number of axons minus 1. Minus 1 because we, we need to include at least one axon. We cannot just include nothing. So that's the where the minus one comes from. So you can see this is a very large number for possible isoforms. And alternative splicing is an important step that contributes to the diversity of mRNA isoforms and hence proteins, because each isoform will then be translated into a protein. And also the aberrant structures. So for example, if we have a weird form of isoform in some cancer cell, or if the isoform expression has a dramatic change in cancer, these can be related to diseases, just like I said, in cancer cells, their structure and their abundance can be different. So RNA sequencing is a technology that allows us to measure isoforms. So what it does is that it first starts with the full-length mRNA transcript. So that's this long line here. And in the first step, this mRNA transcript will be chopped into fragments. This is just due to the technology requires that we cannot sequence too long sequences, so it has to be chopped first. And then to stable RNA, we reversely transcribe it into cDNA. So this stands for synthesized DNA. The reason is that RNA can be easily digested, but cDNA is much more stable and it's double-stranded. And then to start a sequencing, they ligate sequence adapters to each side. This allows the sequencer to sequence the sequence in between. And also to amplify the signal, we often use PCR. So that's the most commonly used technique to amplify DNA sequences. And then there's also a step called fragment size selection so that the two short sequences and two long sequences will be filtered out. And the remaining one will usually be between, I would say, 100 base pair to 300 base pair for sequencing. And see, in the older times, when the next generation sequencing first come out, it's single end. So that means when you sequence each double-stranded cDNA fragment, each strand will be sequenced separately, so you will get two ends, corresponding to the five prime end on the, on, on the positive strand and the five prime end on the negative strand. And later, the technology has been improved, and we can get paired and reads. So that means you can know, OK, these two ends are from the same fragment, so they're paired. So that tells you the two end positions of a, of the, of a cDNA fragment. And this is our data, data. So essentially, what we observed are these paired and RNA secrets. And what we want to recover is the full length mRNA transcript we start with. So to summarize, the isoform discovery problem can be 
illustrated by this diagram. So that means suppose that we have an mRNA transcript or mRNA isoform with three axons. So the red one is the first axon, yellow one second axon, blue one third axon. And from this transcript, those kind of paired and reads can be generated. And these are our data. But in reality, we only observe this data. We don't observe the mRNA transcript. So how do we recover it from the data? Okay, so ju I just want to first discuss some, some of our, our problem setting. So first of all, we have annotations. So let, this is just an example of the annotations of one gene. So annotation told us that, okay, for this gene, biologists have discovered three isoforms before. So these three were verified by experiments. So let's say that if given RNA-seq data for this gene, we want to first try, first test if our, met if our method can discover all these three annotated isoforms. How can we do it? So our strategy is that, because you can see that for the first axon in isoform 2, is only partially overlapping with the first axon in isoform 1 and 3. Then what we do is that we divide this long axon 1 into two parts, so that you see the first part and second part exist both in isoform 1 and 3, and the second part only exists in isoform 2. Oh, sorry, isoform 2 only has the second part. So you see, by defining this something called, we call sub-axon, it means that as long as there's a possible splicing happens here, then for two, for the region between two adjacent splicing sites, we call this a sub-axon. So let's say that in this case, we have seven sub-axons, then by enumerating the possible isoforms from these seven sub-axons, we can get how many? Two to the seven minus one. And out of those, these three should be included. The, these three are just a subset. So this is our way of defining the sub-axon, and also about our data. Because the RNA-seq data are paired and reads, and there are so many. So we want to first compress the information in the data so that the computation storage can be faster, and also the key information will not be lost. So what is the key information here? The key information is in our, for our goal is which two sub-axons are actually connected or are spliced together. So, so therefore, based on this goal, we actually define or compress our paired and read data into those bins. So here we define bin as a four-dimensional vector. So here each dimension is a sub-axon index. So in this case, we see if we're paired and read, it's four positions. So after we map the read to the genome, we know where the read come from. And so the positions, we denote them by S1, E1, S2, E2. And then we convert these positions to the Bing index. So by the sub-axon, they are in. So for example, in this case, first two positions are both in sub-axon 1 and the third and fourth position are both in axon, sub-axon two. Then the corresponding bin is one, one, two, two. So that's in our case. So you see that since we have a total of n sub-axons, sub then we can enumerate what are the possible bins, possible number of bins. So you can see it will be n choose four, plus three times n choose two, plus three times n choose three, plus n choose one. So we can enumerate that number. And so then for each bin, we can just count how many reads are in that bin. So we convert our data into those bin counts. So that becomes our new data. Okay, so with the, the setting and our new data, so we well, want to talk about some old literature on the similar problem. So in, for my Corey data, so this is a PNS paper in 2001. So Li and Wang had a method, a model for probe intensity and isoform abundance. So at that time, people can measure the abundance of known isoforms, I mean the isoforms in the annotation, which we already know the sequence. We can design probes to catch them. And so this, they, they proposed this model. So here the response, our observation, is the probe intensity. 
And this is A is probe affinity. This is something we estimated from our data. And T is your parameter of interest. That's the isoform abundance. And E is the error term. So this is actually a linear model. And later, in 2008, Anton et al. published a paper in Genome Biology, which extends this method to a matrix form. So you see, in this case, we are just talking about one probe at a time in this model. But here, they extend it to a matrix form. And you see that here, V stands for a P by M matrix, which represent the intensities of P probes in M samples. So before here, we just have one probe in one sample. So this is a matrix form of it. And the A then becomes a P by P diagonal matrix, where the diagonal elements represent affinity of the P probes. So the ith diagonal element represents the affinity of the ith probe. And G here is an indicator matrix with binary elements indicating whether each probe can be in each isoform. So you see, here we have a total of P probes and what S isoforms, right? So then the G matrix just is binary and tells you whether a probe can be in the isoform. Because some probes cannot, are outside of the isoform, right? So then that's zero. If a probe can, is consistent or compatible with an isoform, then G will give you a one. And what is T? T is star interest. T is the S by M matrix representing the, the abundance of the S isoforms in M samples. And epsilon is an error matrix. So this is our model. This is their model. So you see, you see that here they introduce this matrix notation so they can account, jointly account for multiple probes in multiple samples together. OK? And what do they do? They use the negative matrix factorization, MMF technique, to satisfy their goal. So what they do is that they first decompose W into two matrices, two non-negative matrices. First one is actually they regard it as the product of A and G. And the second one is T. OK, so they call this A times G as W. So then V is decomposed into W and T. And NMF is a technique which has some advantages over, PC, P, over PCA, so the principal component analysis. The main advantage is that because of the non-negativity constraint, then your decomposed matrices, W and T, will be sparse and will only contain zero and non-negative values. The nice thing for this is that then we can more easily interpret them from biological point of view, right? Because then we can see which which, so each isoform corresponds to which probes and which are the isoform proportions. So, and for we know the isoform proportion should be non negative, and also the, the, the probe composition, which isoform contains which probes, should also be non negative. So, this makes sense. And then, given our decomposition, we would get estimates, which we call W hat. So, with W hat, how can we further get A and G? So in this method, what they do is that for every row of W, they take the maximum and consider the maximum as the diagonal entry of A hat. Remember, the A is a diagonal matrix. So that's how they estimate A. And then they have a similar way to estimate G. So G, which means that they Actually, this should be a negative one, the inverse. So they just look at the inverse of A times W and do a thresholding to make it binary. So this is what they do to, for A hat and G hat. And this is the method. So however, there are several issues with this 2008 method for microarray data. The first problem is that how do we determine the rank of NMF? So in NMF, we, we, we will have the natural result that the rank of the two decomposed matrices should be same, should be equal to each other. But how do we estimate this rank remains an open question. So in other words, this rank will determine the sparsity in your result, or also the dimension and the sparsity. Both will be affected. And another issue is that unlike PCA, PCA can be realized by the single value decomposition, and it has the interpretation like the eigenvalues or eigenvectors. But for NMF, the results are usually not unique. So your algorithm can often lead you to some local minimum. How can you handle this issue is another question. 
and also the isoform structures by this method learned by NMF can be biologically invalid. So for example, some isoform after this composition, you know the gene matrix will denote the isoform structure, right? Which isoform contain which probes. And that result may not be valid because it may contain some, some probes whose sequences are contradicting to each other. So in that case, this is not a valid isoform. And moreover, before we only have by microarray data, which only captures, probe captures the known sequences, now we have RNA-seq data, which we, can seek, which we can use to sequence anything in the sample, even including the unknown transcripts. How can we extend this method to RNA-seq data? That's the, another question. So in isoform discovery field for RNA-seq data, the most commonly used method cufflinks so I think many of you must have used or heard this method. So in this cufflinks method, it's, it's, it regards the problem as to construct a De Bruyne graph to assemble rna seq reads into mRNA isoforms, which are identified as maximal path in the graph. So you see, this is just like a diagram for the graph. So you see that we have different pair than reads, and their edges means that whether they are compatible with each other, whether they are overlapping with each other, then there's an edge between them. And given these paired and reads as nodes and the edges between them, our goal to find isoform is to find the maximum path, the smallest number of maximum paths to explain the read. The advantage of cufflinks is it's annotation free. So it doesn't require your knowledge about the annotation. That means you don't need to know which isoforms have been discovered by biologists before. And it also, because of this goal for finding a maximal path, it's robust to RNA-seq data noise because it aims for the sparse solution. However, there are also issues with this method. That is, it cannot find overlapping isoforms. So let's just give you one example. If this isoform it actually has another one which just contains the first and second axons, but not the third one, then that shorter one is just a subset of a longer one. And by this strategy, they can only discover the longer one, not the shorter one. Okay? And another thing is that for cufflinks, if the gene structure is really complex, then that means we will have many, many edges because some reads can go to many different reads as well. So in this case, the maximal path problem can also be difficult to find for especially human genes because for some human genes, um, some of them can have more than 10 or even more than 20 possible isoforms, then that problem becomes very hard. And I also have a, my own method on, uh, for, for, for doing the same task in 2011. So my method slide takes a totally different perspective. So we use a statistical model based on the law of total probabilities. So this is actually based on the law of, law of total probabilities. So we write down this linear model and we try to estimate the transcript or isoform abundance as this TJ. So TJ stands for the abundance from the, of the J isoform or in other words the probability that the read is from the J isoform. That's our parameter of interest and what we observe like I said is the proportion of reads in the J thing. So this is our response. And then Fij that links the reads to the thing is the conditional probability, which we estimated from model assumptions. So you see, this is the marginal probability for banes. This is the conditional probability of a bane given an isoform. And this is a marginal probability of an isoform. So that's why I said this is based on the law of total probability. And we also introduced the error term here. So because in this case, the number of possible isoforms is 2 to the nth minus 1. That's a very huge number, and that's large, much larger than the total number of veins, which for large n. So in this case, the problem becomes high dimensional, and we need some regularization or shrinkage to make the estimation possible. And here, I borrowed the idea from the Lasso L1 penalization. So basically, we penalize the absolute value of this Tj, and we also we modify this term by dividing Tj by Nj. So here, Nj is the number of axons in the jth isoform. 
So therefore, by introducing the length here, our method will favor the discovery of longer isoforms than shorter isoforms. This is just by, based on our experience with bio, um, learned from biologists who told us that longer isoforms are usually more likely. So that's why we introduced the knowledge here. Okay, so this is our method. But we also have the several issues here. So first of all, the, compared to cufflinks, so slide is more sensitive to RNA seq data noise. So although we are able to discover overlapping isoforms, but we are sensible, more sensitive to RNA seq data noise. And another thing is that for a gene with n exons, we start with two to the nth minus one possible isoforms, and that plays great difficulty on the regularized linear model. So even though the regularized linear model can do sparse estimation but its performance will also decrease as your number of parameters here increases. So that's still a great difficulty. So we want to address those with our pre-selection method. So that's the background and the motivation for this method. So the motivation first is that the large search space for possible isoforms is a big issue for all methods. So we think if we have, can have a pre-selection method to just reduce our search space, and so we can focus more on the more likely isoforms, that will improve the performance. And also, non-negative matrix factorization has good properties, includes the interpretability and sparsity for decomposition result. But like the space method in 2008 has, how to determine the NMF rank and the problem for the non-unique factorization make NMF not directly ap applicable for isoform discovery. So what we propose here is we propose to use NMF to reduce the search space, like I said, by what? By aggregating mRNA isoforms found, MMF, found by MMF over multiple rounds. So we want to address this unknown uniqueness issue and the rank issue by aggregating. So that's our goal. And so back to the NMF. So let me use this diagram to introduce what we are actually doing. This is our input matrix. We have the bins as rows, and we have the samples as columns. So essentially, we are jointly using multiple RNA sequencing data together to help us first identify the possible isoform, isoform candidates. So this is our input. And every entry here is the bin count, is the count of the bin in the sample. So every entry here is a count. And we want to decompose it into what? We want to decompose this matrix into one matrix that represents the existence of bins in isoforms. So here, here the columns become the isoforms. The rows are bins. So if the entry here in one column are non-zero, then it means this corresponding isoform contain those bins. Because we know the bin structure then we know the isoform structure. And then the other one has the rows as the isoforms, columns and the samples, and this is the isoform abundance. So this is what we want to do. And this is the flow chart for our method. So first of all, to make that input matrix, we need some data normalization. So that means here, over here, so for here, for different columns, we need to normalize across them so to make the counts comparable. And then we do multiple rounds. I'm just writing an example number, rounds, 100 rounds here. So every run, we use NMF to decompose this isoform structure matrix and the abundance matrix. And one issue is the same as the space method. That is, whether an isoform here contains conflicting bins. So for example, if one bin let me just give you an example. If one bin is 1, 1, 1, 3, that means it's supporting exon 1, exon 3 are pieced together. But there's another bin, say for example, 1, 1, 2, 2. That tells you that, tells you that the exon 2 is also in the isoform. Then that's conflicting. So if we have this conflicting bin issue, what do we do? We split this isoform into more candidates. So then we would just split this one isoform into two. One has exon one and three pieced together. The other has exons one, two, and three together. So just to resolve this conflicting issue. And this becomes our candidate pool. And so 
then for each different round, we will have each, we have, we will, for each round, we will have a pool. And also, we will also filter out the isoforms which are discovered by NMF, but whose subaxon junctions, for example, if the isoform contains axons, subaxons 1 and 3 and 4, but between axon 3 and 4, there's no reads that support the junction between 3 and 4, then we remove that isoform. So we just do this filtering, so we have 100 pools. And what do we do? We aggregate the result so that only the high frequency isoforms are retained. That means only if an isoform is supported by more than half of those runs, we keep it. Otherwise, we just remove it. So this will give us our final isoform candidates. So we're hoping that these candidates can be used as input for downstream methods such as cufflinks and slide so that their performance can be improved. Okay, so let's, let me just try to further explain what do we mean by the ambiguous isoform. So that's just like I said. So for example, one isoform contains this being 1344 and 2244, but they are conflicting with each other because this one supports axon 1 and 3 are together, and this one supports the existence of axon 2. And also, in our objective function, to solve for the NMF problem, we try to implement this penalty term here to try to avoid those kind of ambiguous candidate isoforms as much as possible. And this is our invention, so the previous space method doesn't have it, so that's why its result has many ambiguous isoforms. Okay, so let me, now let me show some simulation results in Demelangaster. So this is the model organism fruit fly. So we, what we do is that for simulation, we use the software Flux Simulator to simulate RNA stick data from chromosome 3R of fruit fly with reference genome DM6 and 363 and three example annotations of this release. So what we do is that we simulate 50 RNA six samples with this number of molecules and this number of reads. And this is the read length. So we use paired and read, each with length 76. And so the isoform, true isoforms are from the annotation. And we randomly assign their abundance using Flux Simulator. So just as a summary statistic, so we have about 51% of genes containing about 3 to 10 subaxons, and among them, about 44.6% have more than one isoform in the annotation. So we apply them to these genes. And let's see our result. So to evaluate our result, we look at three different levels, nucleotide level, exon level and transcript level. So we just compare the discovered result by, an, by our NMFP. So this is our proposed NMF pre-selection method. So we just look at for the candidates um, found by NMFP. So what is their precision? What is their recall? And what is the F score? So the F score is what? F score is just the average of precision and recall. And so it's it's like the aggregate result from these two. So you can see that if we look at the result, so first of all, if we just use NMFP, the precision at the nucleotide level is low, that's reasonable. Because precision means the number of true positive divided by the number of positive. So because NMFP is just a pre-selection method, so you found more than the truth. So the precision is low, but its recall is very high. Recall means the number of true positives divided by the number of truth, right? So it means, you know, so that means that it, ca it didn't lose much of the truth. So it, it retained the true isoform pretty well. And let's compare the other results. So we use cufflinks alone plus NMFP plus cufflinks. So that means NMFP is the first step, then its result is applied into cufflinks. So if we compare these two, we can see that although if we use cufflinks alone, the precision is higher because it found less and more accurate, but its recall is very bad, only about 0.4 something. So that means it loses a lot of the true nucleotide, but with our method, you see the recall is a lot higher. And therefore, the F score is also a lot higher. 
So this is for cufflinks. And for our slide, because slide is based on a lasso method, right? So lasso has a parameter lambda to to tell you or to, to control the number of retained isoforms. So we try two different lambda, few, two, which give you fewer isoform and which give you more isoform. So we see that in terms of the result, so when slide is applied with the fewer isoform, here, that's the one higher here. So we see that NFP doesn't help slide that much. So this is also reasonable because we have observed that from our previous experience with slide. Slide is very good at capturing the nucleotides. So it doesn't miss a lot of nucleotides and the performance not help much. At the axon level, the results are pretty similar. So I will, I will just say that for cufflinks, you can also see the recall and F score has been boosted a lot. At the transcript level, the results are more informative, more interesting, because essentially we are interested in whether we can discover the full length transcript accurately. So you see that at the transcript level, first again, cufflinks has been helped a lot by this an MFP. And for slide, we also see when slide uh, uh, lambda is, still, is set to a low value, that means slide will return more isoforms. In that case, an MFP can help slide discover the more accurate ones. So the slide performance is also boosted. And we also have an explanation for why cufflinks helps or cufflinks is helped more. The reason is cufflinks itself is not model based. So it's based on the De Bruyne graph and based on finding a maximal path, while our NMFP is sort of model based. So we have that linear model to support the, base, the foundation for the decomposition. So therefore, the NMFP plus cufflinks is like a combined method from both perspectives. While slide itself is already based on a linear model, and so it's more similar to NMFP. So that's, we think that's a possible reason that slide is not helped as much as cufflinks is. But still we see that for slide with this less smaller lambda, its performance also helped. Okay, and let's, we also have some analysis result about the robustness of our method to the choice of NMF rank. So what we do here is that we just vary the rank in NMF and then check the result, precision recall F score. So we see that for a relatively wide range, the result is pretty stable. And for this gene, the number of annotated isoforms is four. Its number of sub is 10. So we see that not just for the four, number four rank here, but for a wide range, the result is pretty stable. So we are suggesting that due to our aggregation of multiple NF, NMF runs, so our method is not so sensitive to the rank choice. So we advise the users just to use the number of annotated isoform, just set as a, that as a rank. And the result should be pretty reasonable. We also do simulation in mouse. So I'll just get the technical details here and let's look at the result. So for mouse, we also evaluate something else besides our the, the graph I showed before, the precision that we called F score for the nucleotide, exon, and transcript level because the result is pretty similar. So I'm just showing some special cases here. So first of all, we look at whether NMFP can help slide to be more robust to lambda. Lambda is the regularization parameter in the lasso. So we see that this is the result before if we don't have NMFP. And this is the result we have with NMFP. So we can see that first of all, it makes the result more stable for different lambda. The reason is also because now we have fewer parameters as the input. So our number of possible isoforms is largely reduced. And we also look at the robustness of our method to the number of samples. Remember, our input is a matrix with rows as the axons and columns as the samples. So we want to test whether our method is robust to the number of samples. And you can see that the results suggest yes. So for a number of samples ranging from 20 to 100, so our results are pretty stable. And we also think this is not an issue for our current study, because there are so many RNA-6 samples for different species, right? Especially for the model organisms, there are many, many samples. So it's not difficult to get just 20 samples at all. 
And we also see that our method can improve the discovery of lowly expressed genes. So for example, if a gene is lowly expressed in some samples, but highly expressed in some other samples, then using our method, we can help the discover, help the discovery of isoform transcripts of this gene in lowly expressed samples by leveraging the information in highly expressed samples. So this is another usage we think about our method. Because for if a gene, if we just use that lowly expressed sample, Due to the low signal, you may not be able to discover its transcripts accurately. By using our method and you use, by combining the information from the highly expressed samples, you are able to do that. Okay, so now let me finally show a, some, a real data case study. So we apply this method to 74 real RNA seq data sets of fruit fly. And we, because for real data, we don't actually know which are the true isoforms. We only have the annotation. And the annotation is supposed to be a subset of the truth. So there can be new ones which are missed by the annotation. So we want to see how our method performs. Okay. So first of all, the top orange ones are annotations. So you see, this is the data. This is how the data looks like. So this tells us, okay, there is some exon, there is exon, there is, there is. So this is the real RNA-seq data. We just got one sample to, to do the plotting. And this is the annotation. And this is the cufflinks applied to this data. You see, cufflinks only found one transcript, and it missed the last exon. But we see the last exon is actually supported by reads. OK, how about if we apply NMFP to the, as a prior step to cufflinks? You see, OK, now more isoforms are discovered, and the last exon is captured. So these ones actually contain the annotation ones. How about slide? If we just apply slide by cell using the large lambda, we get those two isoforms. They are actually fragmented, you see? They are not actually pieced together. But with an MFP as a prior step, we see it found a more reasonable isoform. So this is another setting of slide with a small lambda. So you see, this is what we get still, like fragmented, with an MFP. So they are pieced together. And this is the result by NMFP just itself. So if we don't apply cufflinks or slide, so it still can do a pretty good job, actually. So these ones is like a superset of the annotation. They still contain the annotation very well. OK, so conclusions. So we found that NMFP can effectively shrink the isoform search space to improve the performance of downstream isoform discovery method. And there are two remaining issues with MMP. First of all, first is that the parallelization is important to increase the computational efficiency of NMP because we are doing the multiple NMF runs. And if we can parallelize that step better, then the result can be obtained faster. And proper normalization for the input matrix is necessary for aggregating data from different sources. So we have I posted my source code and examples here available on my web page. So if you are working on this problem and interested in trying our method, so we really welcome your comments. And this is the reference to our paper. So that's all. Thank you.